And, and Jeff, I'm really glad that we had this discussion about the pension issue and the votes that you took back in the early days to help exacerbate where we are today. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Good thing, it was a good thing to learn. Now we know who to blame. <laughs> Representative Mays. I'm from Central Illinois. I'm from Pontiac. And um, for 25 years, I was, in, well, not all 25. The first, the latter 17 of 25, I was 25 years uh, with the Service Master Corporation. In fact, uh, the last 17, I was vice president, I was an officer. And the reason I tell you that is that my adult life has really been in, in the private sector. We own a company called uh, Service Master Clean, which is an industrial commercial cleaning franchise. While I was there, we also acquired a company called Terminex, pest control company. Acquired a lawn care company called True Green. Acquired a maid service company called Mary Maids. So it grew to be uh, premier trade names, in fact, the largest service company in America. I was our uh, vice president for international expansion, so I negotiated our licenses, taking Terminex to the Philippines and Service Master to Honduras and Malaysia and Singapore. So I, I, and I tell you that part of it because it also gives me a chance to experience people with different cultures and religions and, and those kind of things. So for uh, simultaneous to that private sector experience, I was also elected to the State House and later to the State Senate. I did not leave the private sector when I went to the General Assembly. I served as what the, the concept of the Constitution for Illinois had was a, a citizen legislator. And yes, it was hard. It was hard to you know be in the legislature and not miss a day in Springfield, but then also on a Thursday night fly to Madrid, Spain, work on contracts over the weekend, fly back Monday, and be in Springfield for Tuesday and not miss a day in session. But you know, it, it can be it can be done. And the other advantage that it gave me being a citizen legislator uh, from the private sector was it allowed me to be real live, understanding what it means for employment, workers' comp, unemployment insurance, taxes, regulation, all of the things that government has an impact on, either to help you or hurt you. The other advantage it gave me was <coughs> I didn't have to get reelected to have a job. And there's something, I think about what I just told you, there's something really liberating about knowing you can go to Springfield and cast votes because of what your mom helped you become, what you've learned as a, as a young person and into an adulthood. And respectfully to your constituency, but actually be able to make policy for what you believe is the right thing to have happen as opposed to perhaps a politically opportune moment. And that said, I probably cast a few votes. Some people probably didn't at that time think was what they would want to have happen, but I kept getting reelected, in fact, by massive pluralities. So I think I was doing the right thing. About, uh, well, now it's, well, probably about, in, about 2009, uh, I, I was looking at where my state was at and didn't like the way it was going. And I just thought strong and hard about actually going out on that statewide stage and run for a statewide office. <clears throat> now, I know we're not going into the political, but I mean, this is a political discussion, obviously, but um, you know, I'm a Republican, and I'm proud of that, and I know there's probably some Democrats in the room or some independents and so forth, and, and that's all fine, too. But when I look at running in Illinois, every single constitutional officer in this state was a Democrat from the city of Chicago. The Speaker of the House, the President of the Senate, the President of the United States of America. Everybody was a Democrat from the city of Chicago. Now, I'm from Central Illinois. I am white. I am a male. I am a conservative. And I am a Republican. <laughs> and I decided to run in Illinois. <clears throat> My opponent uh, was an African American female, city of Chicago, Democrat, with an Irish last name. So you think about how hard this was going to be. And I went out there, and we were obviously here in Adams County and Brown County and all, all over the place, a lot, a lot, a lot. And we stuck, stuck to talking about the fiscal, you know, the financial. Other issues are important, I know, but that was really what was paramount. And we won. And the reason I'm going telling you about all this, I'm going to tell you the raw politics to it, and then we'll get into some of the substance of, of governing, 
Because I don't care what anyone may tell you they will do for governor, if they don't get in the big chair, it doesn't count. I'm the only Republican running for governor that has actually been able to win a statewide race here in Illinois. I'm the only one. And how do you do that? How do you win a statewide race in this blue? And because I got elected, Judy Barr and Mark Kirk, we finally elected some Republicans in the statewide safe, so maybe it's now dark purple as opposed to a blue state. When I ran, <clears throat> if you don't get 20% of the city of Chicago, okay, doesn't matter what you do in Livingston County or Adams County, even if we had 100% of the turnout in those kind of counties, you don't win a statewide race unless you get 20% of the city of Chicago. 100 years, Ted McClellan from NBC did a check 100 years no one has ever won without getting 20% of Chicago. We got 22. Remember who I told you my opponent was? So for me to get 22, let alone the minimum 20, was a tremendous feat. Our Republican candidate for governor that year got 18. We won and he lost. Keep going through this. There were four people running. Democrat, Republican, and Green, and Libertarian. If one person, when you have four on the ballot, if one of those four gets 50% of the vote, that's pretty substantial. And that's what we did. My Democrat friend, she got 45. Green, Libertarian, two and three. <clears throat> In 40 years, since the 1970 Constitution, only three Republicans had ever been elected comptroller or treasurer. The two offices, they're down ballot, they get little attention, hard to raise money. TV cameras don't show up much, unless you run for governor. Lolita Dieterson, George Lindbergh, and Judy Bartopinka. We don't elect down ballot. And finally, Rutherford got elected. There were 3.8 million people that voted in the 2010 general election. 83,000 less people voted for treasurer than governor. They drop off. You know, you go down ballot and they drop off. Out of six races, they drop off before they get to the bottom of the Constitution. Yet, with 83,000 less people voting for the office of treasurer, I got 66,000 more votes than Pat Quinn got winning the governor's race. With 83,000 less people participating. So I looked at all of that and I said, we can actually win this race. Now, you don't go out and just say you're going to win the race because you think you can without also in your head, mentally, what you're going to have to go through. This is hard. And then what you're going to do when you actually get in the big chair. Because being governor and don't have a, a vision of where you want to go is, is going to be pretty complicated. So let me just be right up front with you. Um, and, and I talked to some of our media friends earlier. There's a lot of issues out there. And some of them are somewhat geographic. If you're in, if you're in uh, the south side of the city of Chicago, crime and drugs and gangs is a huge issue. If you're deep southern Illinois, fracking, coal is a huge issue. If you're in our western part of Illinois or central part of Illinois, agriculture and you know it's a huge part. Of it. So so, but the one issue that runs all the way through is where we are in regards to putting people back to work. Now, I was, I was visiting here with, with, with Jack and the unemployment rate in the area maybe six, between six and seven percent. Okay. You're blessed. Statewide, the unemployment rate is 9.2. You go to Decatur, Kankakee, and Rockford, and it's in double digits. People are hurting for jobs. Now, I realize if you got jobs here and you can't find people to fill them, well, shame on them, but people are hurting for jobs. And when you read the statistics that more people are moving out of Illinois than moving into Illinois, or you talk to the mother that's concerned about her daughter looking to move out of state when she finishes school, and you look at the, the, uh, the husband who's concerned of keeping his job to be able to feed his family, that is the paramount issue that I'm going to be and do as governor. I respect that the other gentlemen that are running may well have a similar type of approach or answer to it, but here. What will Rutherford do as your governor? Three things. Number one, I selected a lieutenant governor. Now let me take a pause here. There's a candidate for lieutenant governor for your area who's running uh, with one of my challengers. I know her very well. 
she and I are friends. We get along very, very well. I even spoke to her on the phone and I wish her well. But you're gonna be elected a governor, not a lieutenant governor. And that's where I hope that as you give me the opportunity to earn your support as your governor candidate, that you won't just look at a parochial reason to, to see who's gonna be the, the, the lieutenant. My lieutenant governor's background, he's a, a, a businessman, was a local elected official, uh, ran statewide before, lost to Lisa Madigan, but he got 1.2 million votes against the highest voting Democrat. Um, and he's a business guy that works with companies that are looking to locate in Illinois, primarily from overseas, to set up factories. So there's a new solar panel manufacturing facility that's located in northern uh, uh, suburbs of Cook County. He helps negotiate bringing that in. Works with companies that export overseas, IDT up in Belvedere. Now, through Steve Kim, Steve's efforts, was able to negotiate so that they are now selling their barrier protectors that go around nuclear power plants and embassies to Saudi Arabia for the nuclear power generation facilities there, employing folks in Belvedere. Works with companies that are looking to expand. Uh, Coil's company in Dwight, Illinois, through Steve's efforts. So he, he's got live experience of how you bring in companies, help them expand. I am naming my lieutenant governor to be the director of the governor's office of job creation and retention. No further appropriations. That office is not going to be just waiting for me to, to die. They're gonna, they're gonna actually be a, a functioning, working office to be the ombudsman for particularly small and medium-sized companies that have challenges within their own government of Illinois. And the two examples I will give you is, number one, the nice lady that I sat down with in Kane County, she has a floral shop. I asked her how many people does she employ, and she said one, herself. I said, you are a small business, God bless you. Her problem, she pays her quarterly sales tax you know, at the end of the quarter, so she goes online to the servers to the Illinois Department of Revenue to pay her quarterly sales tax and she can't get through. The servers are full. So she goes through the day, she goes through the night. You know where I'm going with this. She got to midnight and still couldn't get through the Illinois Department of Revenue servers to pay her quarterly sales tax. It's not her obligation to give the government more, it's her cash before it's due. When it's due, it's due. You don't have to turn it over beforehand. Cash is king. She didn't get through. Next morning, boom, got right on, paid her quarterly sales tax, called the Department of Revenue. Yep, she got a penalty. And she was incensed. And the response from her own government, Department of Revenue, was, oh, this happens all the time at the end of the quarter. If you want to buy a ticket on American Airlines to get the discount fare to Phoenix, Arizona, and it expires at midnight, you can go on AA.com until 11.59 p.m. dot ought, 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 and buy your ticket. What is this woman's recourse? She didn't have one. Rutherford administration, working with the Lieutenant Governor's Office of Job Creation and Retention, we're gonna get that thing fixed. I'll whistle in the Director of Revenue and give them the story about AA.com and tell them to fix it. You're the egg production facility up in Stevenson County outside of Freeport. True story. Toured their, uh, toured their farm. They produce a million eggs a day. That's a big chicken. <laughs> <laughs> and they employ a lot of people. You know, and it's, and it's state of the art, you know, how you recycle the manure, how you egg sizing. I mean, it's just phenomenal operation. So, he's got the new equipment, which he has purchased and was sitting in that, on that floor, ready to hook up to expand his operation, would be hiring 18 additional employees, because they got a bigger contract, and I, I don't remember if it was Walmart or Walgreens, but one of the big guys, to sell more eggs. The inspectors from the state of Illinois came in, which they should, and there was, I think, six, six things they needed to do before they could hook it all up. I don't know what it was, you know, lighting, size, something. So they did the six things. Three months later, the inspectors from that state, state agency came back and agreed those six things were done and found four more. Now this guy is going out of his mind. He's got how many hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment already on the floor, ready to plug in. He's 
He's got 18 people ready to hire. But because his state government <coughs> didn't tell him the 10 things when they were there the first time, waited three months later, told him the four more, he's now likely having to wait three more months to do it. What's his recourse? Governor's Office of Job Creation and Retention. And when I'm the governor, whether it was Department of Public Health, Department of Agriculture, whoever it is, I'm going to whistle in my director and say, this is not acceptable. You are the barrier to job creation and retention, just in our own government. Number two, as governor, I appoint the directors of every single state agency. Department of Revenue, Department of Agriculture, Department of Public Health, Environmental Protection Agency, Nuclear Safety, Mines and Minerals, you name it, I appoint them. I'm going to have every appointee of the Rutherford Governor's Office understand they must do their mission. Historic preservation, natural resources. You must do your mission. And you'll sit in front of me in Springfield, in the Governor's Office, and look me in the eye, and before I sign your appointment paper, you commit to this governor that you will do everything within your agency to help create jobs and retain jobs in this state. Such that if the first example had to happen, and I whistle you in, you will fix that server in the Department of Revenue, and you will have your inspectors go through the comprehensive list of what needs to be done so that that guy can hire 18 people. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? The problem we have is government doesn't function that way unless the chief executive officer himself insists it happen. That's why this private sector business guy who's dealt with regulations and those kind of things will do that. The third thing I will do as your governor is I will be our chief marketing officer. I believe Illinois is a very, very good state. Now, there's some things we can all talk about that we've got to do to make it better. I get that. But Illinois, a lot of good power. No better place on the planet for nuclear power than here. A lot of water, transportation, road, rail, highway, schools, educational, vocational training, apprenticeship programs. I mean, there's a lot of lot of good stuff out of Illinois, but we're just not, we're kind of head down and avoid eye contact right now. And we were just kind of sort of embarrassed. I'm going to be our chief marketing officer. So, when Governor Chris Christie from New Jersey comes to Chicago and bashes our state and talks about taking jobs away, or Governor Rick Perry comes parachuting in from Texas about taking jobs away from Illinois, I'm going to do like I did as treasurer. You have to notice those are two Republican governors that came in this state. So the first thing the Chicago television cameras did was come running and looking for a Republican to see what I thought about the whole thing. And I looked the cameras right in the eye and I said, you know what, this is a good state. Went down the reasons. Governor Perry and Governor Christie, thank you for coming in here and spend as much money as you possibly can in our state, but then leave. <laughs> I'm going to be the guy that will go toe-to-toe -to -toe and nose-to-nose -nose with these other states and other people when they come in here and be the advocate about how good Illinois is. Because right now, it's Pat Quinn, and it's not working. Those are the kind of things that I will do that I'm going to assume, I'm going to assume I may have a Democrat General Assembly still, considering they got super majorities today. I'm not sure the politic of 2014 election will change that. So I'm going to assume I'm going to have that. But did you notice those three things I told you? I don't need the General Assembly's approval to do those. As a strong executive with experience, that's what I'm going to do as the governor of Illinois. Now, let's go to questions because there's a lot of things you, you may individually want to have me respond to, and I'd be delighted to do that. Are you raising your hand? Or you're my staff. Why are you going to ask me a question? <laughs> <laughs> He's got the planning question. Well, to be a good state, you're going to have to get your finances in, in order. I mean, it's one thing to, to market it, but it's the other thing just to have to have the financing, sure. pensions, right. all the, the tax. I mean, where are you at on the sunsetting of the tax, sure. current tax? Uh, let's go. Plan. Let's talk on pensions and then the tax. Thanks, Casey. Pensions. Where I believe this administration made their big mistake on these state pension issues was January 2011, when they raised the income tax without fixing the problem. That's where the mistake took place. And I'm going to answer your question about the extension in a moment, but I have to talk you through this. If revenue. If revenue should, by some, thought to be a part of the fix, then it should never have been singularly voted on without where are you at on the budget spending, where are you at on the borrowing, and especially where are you at on the pension issue.
Remember I told you I negotiated contracts for a living. And I negotiated with some of the best on this planet. And one thing I learned about negotiating a contract is you don't agree to just one thing and hope the rest of it's going to come along. And that's what they did in January of 11 when they raised the income tax. The amount of money that was raised in that income tax for that first fiscal year <coughs> was dollar for dollar the amount to pay for the increased payment in pensions. Did nothing for outstanding bills. In fact, the outstanding bills owed to school district, people that deliver bread to prisons, services for developmental disabled was $8.5 billion. Two years later, January of 13, the outstanding bills after the income tax increase was $9 billion. It paid the increased payment in pensions. So what should have happened in 2011 was if revenue is a part of the discussion, put it on the table. Governor Quinn should never have signed that without insisting upon having comprehensive, fair pension reform. We have now gone two and a half years down the road. Our bond ratings have gone down. Our unemployment has gone up. He's vetoed their salaries. Well, that was brilliant. And then, still haven't got fixed the pension. All right, January 2015, I'm the governor of Illinois. The majority of the income tax increase is due to expire. Okay? I am going to say this three times. And I want everybody, and I see I'm being taped. I'm going to say this three times for the income tax increase. I don't want it to stay, I don't want it to stay, I don't want it to stay. Okay, clear? All right, the reason I did that was because some of my opponents have already started to twist what I'm saying. I don't want it to stay. But in the next year and a half before I'm governor, will the state public pension issue be fairly resolved? Will there be an appropriate spending pattern within the state budget? Will the issue with regards to continuing debt borrowing of Illinois be resolved? Okay. I don't know that we know the answer to those, but my speculation is some component of those three things just aren't going to be fixed the right way in the next year and a half because they've already had two and a half years and they haven't had a good track record of it. Okay. I don't want it to stay. But when I'm governor in, in 2015, some form of revenue may need to be on the table as a part of the negotiation to resolve the Illinois' financial situation. For the candidate for governor that will stand before you perhaps in a future lunch and say right up front that they're going to veto the extension, the question to be asked is, where will you come up with $7 billion worth of cuts in the Illinois state budget? That's what it is. Seven billion. Now, five times I will now have said it. I don't want it to stay. But I'm also not going to be truthful to the public of Illinois. If they haven't fixed those things, I may have to be the hard, tough love negotiator, just like I was in Santiago, Chile, putting the business relationship together there. I'm not, I'm not a pushover negotiator. But there may need to have a part of that on the table for discussion to finally comprehensively resolve the financial problem of our state. I think that's a fair answer. Sir? What are your thoughts on uh, tax incentives to keep companies like ADM in the state mm -hmm. and others? <laughs> I'll tell you what, when I was in Decatur, that whole thing came up, of course, and the TV cameras come right to me, and I'm standing right there in Decatur. Hello, Mr. ADM. Um, let me answer a different question first, and then I'll go to that. I have seen governors stand before the assembly and talk about closing tax loopholes. Well, I don't like that word. As a businessman, as your governor, I am going to have accountability for tax incentives. So when they talk about the motion picture tax credit, the manufacturing tax credit, the research and development tax credit, the printer's tax credit. I look at every one of those as a positive approach for increasing employment and expanding business. As a businessman, though, I think it's a very fair thing to say, so when the House Revenue Committee comes up and says, we're going to close this tax loophole of whatever, this governor will say, fair enough, let's talk about it. Give me the actuarial 
return of that tax incentive to show <coughs> that it works. If we're creating more jobs and it helps bring in business or keeps businesses, and you pass that and put it on my desk, I'm vetoing it. If it doesn't bring in more jobs and create retention, and it's a burden, and it doesn't work, I'm signing it. Pretty simple. I happen to think, I want ADM to stay in Illinois, okay, up front. But I do not, I do not look kindly upon special legislation for specific companies, whether it's the CME, whether it's Sears, or whether it's ADM. If it's good enough for the needs of ADM, make it law so every qualifying company can participate in the same benefit program. If it's good enough for CME and Sears, then make it whoever company may well be here in Quincy to take advantage of it. Now, I, I'm not going to go down the path they don't have enough lobbyists and they got you know paid lawyers and all that kind of stuff. I look at it as I want these companies to stay. I get the reason that the, the mindset has to go through. But when you start passing special legislation for specific companies, you always have a winner and somebody loses. This governor will be very, very advocating of if it's good enough for A, then it should be good enough for everybody. Recognizing Sir? that you needed to take a, a certain percentage of the cook in the Collar counties, what will your campaign be up there? How do you convince 20% uh -huh. of the people to vote for you? <clears throat> All right, now I'm going to be real blunt. I'm a Republican and I'm proud of it, <clears throat> but our brand is damaged. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's damaged. A lot of people, particularly minorities and the gay and lesbian community, think that we have horns and a tail. And I'm just being real candid with you. Part of my success was and will be is I'm really pretty reasonable. I mean, I got my strong positions and so forth, but I understand that there's a lot of differences out there. In fact, I, <clears throat> there were 10 counties that Alan Keyes beat Barack Obama when he ran for the U.S. Senate. 10 counties. Now, you can imagine how strongly conservative those 10 are. One of them was Edgar County. Edgar County chairman of the Republican Party called me up and said, we really want you to be our Lincoln Day speaker. I said, Mr. Chairman, I'd be honored to. When is, he said, any day you pick. <laughs> that was pretty accommodating. <laughs> because we want you. I said, okay, Mr. Chairman, I will. I went over there to see Edgar County. Remember who I told you this, the profile this county is? And later, I, after it was over with, I asked him, why me? And I gave a speech about the, you know, the economy and da 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 and it was okay, but, you know, keep it kind of glazing over. And then, in this county, I specifically said, and I don't change my speeches in, that, in this regard, I said, if we as Republicans allow abortion, gay rights, or <coughs> guns to define a good Republican from a bad Republican, we will be the party of the perpetual minority. People's heads, heads start hotting. People's heads start nodding. The women started nodding. The men did. And by the time I got done, I got a standing cheering ovation. Because I believe that you got to say those things. There's good Republicans out there that don't agree on all of those issues. In fact, Ronald Reagan's principle or theory of being with me 80% of the time, we can earn the right to govern as opposed to 100% of the time, we're going to always lose. That's a start. Second, the minority communities in the urban area has been a constituency that I have been involved with for years and years and years. Example, 2010, I'm running for state treasurer. I am going to the Punjab Cultural Society. Punjab, part of India, you know, section of India. And I'm introduced State Senator Dan Rutherford, who's running for state treasurer, a good friend of the Punjabis. I get up there, give my presentation, 800 Sikhs with their turbans and their beards. All of them are Americans, and they all have businesses, and they are very interested in their state's future. 800 of them, give me a standing ovation, who, by the way, I forgot to say, in the introduction in 2010, he's been with us for the fifth year in a row. 2013, Saturday night before my Christian's holiday Easter. I get a hold of Josh Lanning, you know Josh Randy, my executive assistant. I said, we're going to Chicago. 
He goes, I'm getting family over to my house tomorrow for Easter. You get your family. What are we doing? I said, we're going up to the Punjabi Cultural Society. I said, we're not going to stay, but I got to go. We went up there. I kid you not. We were, were you with me that night? We on the road? I think I was. Yeah, Casey was road warrior with Josh. And by the time we got to the curb, to the auditorium, it took about 45 minutes just for people shaking hands, taking photos, wanting an autograph. I get up in the front of this audience, which is now 1,200. They increased from 800 three years later to 400. I got up and said, I'm sorry, I can't stay. Tomorrow is my Christian holiday, Easter. But I'm here in respect to your holiday of food harvest. I was introduced as having been with him for the eighth year in a row. 1,200 seats got up and gave me a standing cheering ovation. Eastern European, Slovak, Czech, Polish. There is no larger Polish concentration of, 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 of people in this world outside of Warsaw than in the city of Chicago. When I am the master of ceremonies at the Polish Constitutional Day dinner, when the Polish Council General changes out and a new one came in, she calls me up and says, Mr. Rutherford, I'd like to meet you. I go, Madam uh, Kapuczynski, I would look forward to meeting you. She goes, no, I don't think you understand. The Polish community of Chicago leadership said there is no other person that you need to meet sooner than Dan Rutherford. He's done more for the Polish American community in Chicago than anyone. You get 22% of the city of Chicago. You know what, candidly, I voted for civil unions. I was the only Republican that voted for civil unions. I happen to think that two consenting adults, same sex or opposite sex, want to have a union to determine um, hospice care, financial, but who's my government to get in the middle of that? Go ahead and make that decision. Some of the candidates for governor said that they were going to try to veto it. I think it's wrong. Gay marriage came up. I didn't support gay marriage, and the reason I didn't support it, and many thought I would because of civil unions, the reason I didn't support gay marriage is the religious component to it. I think there's a difference in a religious aspect to it than a civil aspect to it. So now, when the gay and lesbian community, which is a massive voting bloc in the Chicago urban area, sees a Republican, all right, he ain't everything they wanted, but he's reasonable. So you see where, I, see where I'm going with this stuff? That's where, if we're going to earn the right, if we're going to earn the right to once again govern this state, we got to understand there's a lot of diversity out there. There's a lot of people that aren't Christian. And there's a lot of people that aren't white. And in order to be tolerant, accepting, and willing to recognize that probably comes from 25 years as a vice president of an international company that opened businesses in countries where Christianity was a minority and the white population was an absolute minority. What other comments or suggestions or questions you have for me? Sir. And I, tell me where we're going on time, too, because I'm, Amy, you, you, you tell us. I'm sorry, Jared. Um, <clears throat> run a not-for-profit nursing home here in town on a temporary contract, but the, the question kind of goes statewide. 60% uh, or, or better of most facilities are, are Medicaid. Right. And, you know, we have a number of issues with, with that relative to lack of pay or you know, low pay and, and, and timeliness of pay and so forth. But one of the specific issues we, we seem to be having is is uh, Medicaid pending applications. We currently have like 15 folks pending applications. Some of them have been pending as long as a year. What do you mean pending? The, the future the, the resident? Family, the family and or resident <coughs> has made the application to the department. To be a Medicaid, to be a Medicaid eligible, eligible okay. person. We're caring for them this whole time. They're still pending in the system, which means that the dollar amount the state owes is not being calculated as part of what's being owed. Okay? I see. That's about four hundred some thousand dollars to us, but if you multiply that statewide, it's a lot of money. I'm yep, sure yep. that may be part of the problem. But I'm thinking if you know, since the changes came into and the expansion came through, that if the state can sign up, you know, thousands of folks in a month for the uh, Medicaid exchange, why can't we get Medicaid pending seniors approved for Medicaid for nursing homes? Good question, Jerry. <laughs> Seriously, good question. And when I appoint the director of that state agency. Guess what? They're going to have to look me in the eye and help resolve and give me that answer. And I'm not being coy with you. I mean, you're right. <clears throat> Just as a personal background, you're familiar with the MDS, the Minimum Data Set? It took me three years. I negotiated that law from the old IOC, Inspection and Care, to the MDS. I'm very, very familiar 
with the funding formula to issue some long-term care. In fact, if there's anything from my background in the legislature that I spent any time on longer than any one issue that is probably, and I say this kindly, as boring as you can ever think of, <laughs> it is the, because the formula for reimbursement rates to go from IOC to MDS. I am familiar with the issue. I don't know the answer to your question, but keep in mind, I will be appointing the director of that state agency, and that is a fair thing for that agency director to have to resolve for me. Does somebody else over here? Yeah, yes, just sir. a footnote. You know, your uh, comment about the gal who was paying her taxes, I went to renew my boat sticker yesterday and got the same thing. Couldn't Called, get through other servers? Could, couldn't get through, period. You know, what did, had the right numbers and couldn't get through, period. Um, called the folks at the at the DNR and said, uh, what do you suggest I do? I said, do you get many of these calls? She said, almost all of my calls are this exact comment. So she suggested I go ahead and print out the paper and send in the paper application. Looks like I'm whistling in the director of DNR too, doesn't it? <laughs> you know what? Thank you for sharing. At, at, which, at which point I said, did the same people that designed Obamacare? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah that <laughs> the, But see, this is this is this is this is real. I mean, this is real. It's your own government. And I gotta tell you, it's not hard. Okay, some reason, maybe they don't have enough money, and I get all that. So where's the plan? Just where's the plan? Does the director of Department of Natural Resources, who under the Rutherford administration, understand that I don't want to be here at the chamber in Quincy and have a guy tell me he can't get through on the server to get his boat license because it's clogged? And then you know I'm going to tell that director of DNR, if you want to buy a ticket on American Airlines, you can, you know, I'll tell him the same thing. I'm sorry, Mike. What effect do you think? Obamacare is going to have on Illinois. Illinois, you know, we got futures coming down the road. Um, we're hearing awful lot of bad things now about the individual markets are going, you know, people losing their stuff there. I just learned yesterday that we can start expecting the small group market to start experiencing the same thing. As families are getting hurt, we have a lot less money to spend because we're going to be putting in health. Plus, we've made commitments for, on the state side to fund um, Obamacare. What do you see down the road financially and as an obligation to the state? How, what are you going to do as the governor? Because you're going to have, probably have to deal with it. What, what kind of obligations we, do we see going down well, the road? Well, let me, um, and this may not be the total answer you're going to like. Uh, Another answer that I've so far gotten I don't like. Yeah, well, <laughs> in that it, it's, it's the law. You know, and, and Congress has tried to not pass it, and then they try to defund it, and all that. Okay, you know what, though? It's the law. And as governor of Illinois, I'm going to have to implement the law. I mean, I'm not going to be one of these guys that, you know, I mean, I, I take an oath to uphold the law. So I have to do that. But as governor, I also will be able to determine if there's certain things we do participate in or not. And that is where I will be able to use the executive authority as the governor. So, if Pat Quinn has already, whatever it is, signed the deal, passed the law, and it became the law of Illinois, separate from federal, the option is, can the law be repealed? That will necessitate the assembly. If it is by executive order, I will have my legal counsel look at and see if it is appropriate, able to have this governor reverse it. But part, again, as I said, maybe not everybody likes, I happen to think it was federal law, I have to implement it. But as the treasurer, do you have some kind of an idea of what financially this is going to do to the state? No. Or do we and, have any know, clue? Or? Well, now, now you asked me two <coughs> questions. You asked me two questions. As treasurer, no. In fact, let me just be, just everybody understand, the office of treasurer is really the investment officer. So the determination of where and how money is borrowed or spent is the authority of the governor and the general assembly. Okay, so I am, I'm really an investment officer. Um, there are projections, I believe. I don't believe any of them. I think they are just woefully lacking. This thing is going to mushroom, in my opinion, just, I don't want to say out of control, but I think this is going to mushroom beyond anything that we expect it to be, no matter what number I'm given today. Now that's your note. <laughs> any other questions? Yes, please. Let's talk a little bit about education and how 
obviously the impact to the cuts in general state aid and transportation reimbursements affect the downstate schools sure. so much more. Um, feeling like the current administration is, you know, kind of pushing us towards school consolidation. Just wondering what your thoughts are on sure. that. Sure. <clears throat> well, that's where <coughs> if somebody says they're going to not have any revenue as a part of 2015, Ask them where they're going to get that seven billion. Okay. The other, the other comment I would make about it is, as a governor, I will be doing similar to my actions as when I was in the legislature. When we have these grand, good ideas of mandates that our schools need to put into place and don't fund them, I will beat them. Just, it's pretty simple. Maybe it's an absolutely wonderful program. But if this General Assembly says to your school board and your superintendent, you need to do X, then pay for it. If you don't, I'm vetoing it. And the ultimate answer to get to the point that you asked is the state public pensions. If that is not fairly resolved, there's nothing more you can do. I mean, I mean, you look, we've already had this income tax increase, and it didn't do anything. It didn't do anything except pay for pensions. That should be made. I don't, I'm not diminishing that. So the, the best I can give you with regards to how you deal with education, education funding, is fix the state pension issue. Because until that's fixed, you can't even begin to address additional resources going to schools. Philosophically, how I think about it, though, unfunded mandates this governor will be tough. Anything else for me? Then if not, let me um, 